Hello and uh, welcome. This is uh, SFU Math 232. My name is uh, Brenna Davison. This is uh, section 2.3, Applications of Linear Systems. So we're just uh, starting out in, in the course really and so far what we've seen is how to take a system of linear equations, uh, represent that uh, in an augmented matrix, and then we've seen how to use elementary row operations in order to reduce the uh, change the uh, the augmented matrix into an equivalent system and one that allows us to read out uh, what the solution to the system of linear equations is. Now, we did that uh, using a Gaussian elimination and then further Gauss-Jordan elimination. Uh, there was two forms of the matrix that were important. Uh, one was the uh, row echelon form that was after Gaussian elimination and then the second one was the reduced row echelon form after the Gauss-Jordan elimination. Okay. So we've learned how to do this and now we're just going to take a look at three applications of like we'll have a physical uh, situation and we'll see how to set that up as a system of linear equations and then we'll see what to do with the augmented matrix in order to get a solution to the problem. So this is actually a good uh, opportunity to practice what we've learned in the last couple of lectures and in fact it may be a good exercise for you just to stop uh, the lecture right now and take a look at the examples I'm going to do. Uh, attempt to do them yourself because you, you do have the skills for this uh, given that you understood the, the first two lectures. So if you feel that you understood the first two lectures well, rather than watching me solve these problems, uh, uh, do it yourself and 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 put the time in and then uh, come back to the to the video and oh, um, check in with what I did, perhaps catch mistakes if I've made any, or perhaps uh, verify your own work, or if then something wasn't clear when you were doing it yourself, then you can perhaps straighten that out. Okay, so we're, the first application we're going to take a look at is uh, a flow network. So this is basically like a, a plumbing problem. We're going to have a collection of branches through which something flows and the branches uh, meet at nodes. So this could be kind of anything, electricity flowing through wires, liquid flowing through pipes, uh, traffic um, flowing on roads. If you have some sort of a idea of... Uh, um, something through which things flow. Like let's just to sort of imagine a plumbing problem. Uh, let's just say, I don't know, let's just draw something like this. Yeah, just sort of, just sort of a, a random example really. We have, we can imagine we have a situation like this and uh, we have um, <clears throat> uh, two sort of pipes coming in and I could sort of imagine I would have a situation where um, uh, 10 liters of some sort of fluid was flowing in this branch and then 15 liters flowing in this branch and then what would have to be here well we're going to see here what the, the properties that we normally take to be satisfied of these kind of problems is that 25 liters would have to be flowing here because uh, you know we have 10 and 15 coming in it doesn't sort of <laughs> and disappear and there doesn't you know spontaneously get produced either so we expect 25 liters there and then there's three paths for it to flow out maybe the pipes aren't quite the same size and we have uh, five liters flowing out here um, 12 liters flowing out here and um, eight liters flowing out here again we would expect uh, that these three things here would add up to 25 and that at the input here uh, we would have uh, some number going in we have here in this example 25 liters and then over here at the output we would also have 25 liters flowing out so that's that's our, our flow network and so that's the properties that you would it sort of would I would say would be common sense we have oh, one directional flow you don't have water flowing two different ways um, uh, in a pipe, typically, I mean, this maybe sound, might, could, could potentially sound a little bit silly, but actually sometimes, for example, in a river, imagine we have a river like this, you can have the, the river flowing in this direction, and you could, for example, have a small back eddy uh, close to the shore. We're, we're, not, we're not having that situation. We're, we are having the situation that in each branch the flow is in, in one direction. So it's not a completely silly statement, but that is a sort of a, a typical, simple um, uh, type of flow. Okay, uh, we have flow conservation at the nodes. That's that this in this diagram up here. This would be a node, so that you have some stuff coming in, some stuff coming in, and some things going out. And you expect that what goes out is the sum of what comes in. So that's uh, flow conservation at the nodes. 
and uh, we also expect flow conservation in the network. That's this here. We've got an input amount of flow in and we expect the same amount out. We're not losing anything. I mean, you can see that you could have a more sophisticated model. Maybe if it was electricity kind of model, maybe uh, for whatever reason, heat or something like that, you're losing you're losing some of your energy uh, in the circuit. That could happen, but uh, in the in the simplistic model, uh, these are the these are our our, our flow uh, networks uh, properties to be satisfied. Okay, so we're going to take an example here. We're looking at uh, 100 liters coming in. Um, so this could be I don't know a number of cars, liters of a liquid, uh, current in an electrical circuit. Doesn't really matter. We're looking at 100 100 something in. So I'm just going to say 100 in the units will be, of course, depend on the type of um, physical uh, problem that you could have. I mean, I just said this, but uh, like it could be number of cars. This was a road system. Uh, it could be uh, liters of liquid. Um, it could be uh, current in an electrical circuit. Okay, so there's a bunch of possibilities. Uh, undoubtedly, there's more possibilities than this, but you get the idea. You have some thing that you're counting, and a certain amount of it is coming in. So our our we have the one directional flow property satisfied. Uh, we have a uh, hundred of whatever these things are coming in, and then you can see uh, the output here. You've got 30 and 70, so we have over here 100 out. So we have the um, flow conservation in the network. And then you could check at each one of these things, um, the dots, which we are calling nodes. So you could check at each one of these nodes. For example, at this node here, uh, we have, by, given by the arrows that are on here, you have 60 of something coming in and you have 10 and 50 going out. So you have 60 in and then you have um, 10 plus 50 out. So that's 60. So at each one of the nodes that, that will happen, uh, there's that. so that's what we're calling the flow conservation at the nodes. Okay, so typically what we have is a problem where we know the flow on some of the branches and we don't know what's happening in some of the other uh, branches and we want to uh, figure that out. So that's what we're going to use our system of linear equations to do. So I'll, 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 sh I'll illustrate this via an example. Here's an example here, a flow network. So what we have here is uh, a network of one-way streets with traffic flowing in the direction indicated. So there is some unknown traffic flow. So what we're saying is, is here, for example, we know uh, um, from, from this node or maybe an intersection here that 100 cars are flowing out. And at this node here, 100 car, uh, sorry, 500 cars are flowing in. You know, at this one, 100 out, and at this one, 300 in, and we want to know how many cars are there on the un where we don't know, which we which I have labeled x1, x2, x3, and x4. So in a problem like this, uh, the first step is to assign variables to unknown flows. So that's that's what has been done. That's the x1, x2, x3, and x4. Assign variables to unknown flows. Okay, step one. Okay, what about the direction? You, you can see what's happened is th this is showing a direction. So if if x1 is positive, the direction will be there from left to right. We don't need to worry. We, we, we don't actually know uh, which direction that x1 flow is, but we don't actually have to worry about that because if x1 turns out to be negative, that means we just have to reorient the uh, arrow in the other direction. Okay, so let's just make a note of that. Assign variables. Uh, we, we don't worry about direction because uh, if a variable, let's just put it this way, if a variable is negative, I'm going to be right negative like that, negative, then the flow is in the opposite direction uh, to what I assumed. Okay, so just, just take a guess, and it doesn't matter if it's wrong, it'll come out in the wash. Okay, so that's that's the thing. Uh, then uh, that's uh, step one. And then uh, step two, uh, use uh, the conservation of slow, flow at each node. That's what I'm going to use. Use conservation. of flow at each node 
uh, to generate the put it this way in fact to generate as many equations as there are unknown so that's my symbol of them for equations as many equations as there are unknowns okay so that's what we want to do and that'll allow us to get a system of linear equations um, we don't when we're doing a problem like this we don't necessarily expect when we solve it to get to find out that uh, um, there's no solution uh, that would mean that just what, what we've set up is actually not physically possible um, typically if, we're, if we have an actual thing where we can measure some things in a laboratory and there's some things that we can't measure and we want to figure out what they must be, uh, be because it's physically working in the laboratory we wouldn't expect to come up with no solution uh, if it's just a hypothetical problem then it's possible we've posed a problem for which you you you, you can't solve it so then you would get a um, a no solution problem okay you may not uh, expect there to be an infinite number of solutions but uh, uh, again, that depends, and it is, it is um, maybe not typical, but it is possible, which we, in fact, will see in this case. Okay, so I'm going to just label the nodes, so then I can show you which equation I am I am generating from each node. So I'm just going to be labeling the nodes so I can refer to them. That is node 1, node 2, node 3, and node 4. Okay, and so then what I want to do is use each one of the at each one of those nodes I want to uh, use the conservation of flow to generate an equation. So looking at node one, you can see that um, x one is going out and one hundred is going out, and x four is coming in. So at node one, it is the case that what's coming in to node one x four must equal what is going out of node one, which is 100 plus x1. Okay, then I just do the same thing at node 2. I look and say, what is coming in to node 2? 500 plus x1 is coming into node 2. And what is going out of node 2? Going out of node 2 is x2. Similarly, for node 3 and node 4. And there's node 4. Uh, see what's coming into node 4 is x2. And what is going out is 100 and x3. Okay, so then I rewrite these uh, equations in the way that we are used to seeing them with all the variables on the left and all of the, co and the constants on the right. So then this would, and I usually would, uh, because I know I'm going to put this into an augmented matrix, what I do is I write the equations with x1 first, x2 second, x3 third, and x4 fourth. So I would take this first equation, and this is just simply a rewriting of it. I would go like this, x1 plus x4 is 100, and then x1 minus x2 is minus 500. Um, x3 minus x4 is 300, and x2 minus x3 is 100. Okay. Now uh, what I can do is capture this system of linear equations in an augmented matrix. And then I've sort of, it, I guess in that sense, I've once I've done this, I've abstracted this, this network flow problem into an augmented matrix and this augmented matrix really in some sense now could could have been a representation of anything and then what I do is I apply my algorithmic manner of reducing this and then I find out the solution uh, set and then I can apply that back to the physical problem and see what's happening so let me uh, write the augmented matrix here it's going to have um, five columns one for each variable and then one for the constant terms on the right so in the first row it'll be minus one 0, 0, 1. That is minus 1, x1, and there's no x2 here. There's no x2, there's no x3, that's those two zeros, and then there's 1, x4. And then on the on the right hand side is that constant 100. Okay, similarly for the next equation, it'll be 1, 
minus 1, 0, 0. So that's x1, that's this here, x1, minus x2, plus 0, x3, plus 0, x4. There's no x3 or x4 here. Okay, so that's how I get that one there. So I do that for all four of these. That, that of course, is going to be here, minus 500. And I do the next one, uh, 0, 0, 1, minus 1. There's your this right here is your x3 minus x4. And I get a constant here, 300. And then the last one is this. Okay, there I have it. So now I'm where I should be able to handle, uh, given the Gaussian elimination that I saw last lecture. I've got an augmented matrix. I want to uh, reduce it to its row echelon form through which I can then read off the solutions using back substitution if, if I so desire. Okay, so I'm now going to use those three row elementary row operations. I can multiply a row by a constant. I can exchange two rows and I can add a multiple of one row to another. Those things do not change the solution set of the linear uh, uh, the uh, linear system that I have here. And I'm going to indicate these uh, sort of uh, these equivalent uh, augmented matrices by putting a little tilde between them. And I'm going to write the operation that I'm doing going from one step to the another. So I'm going to I'm going to say row one. I'm going to look I'm going to look at row one. And what I'm going to do is replace row one with minus one times row one. And then I'm going to put this little tilde sign to say here's an augmented matrix that has the same solution set as my original one. So then I'm just going to go ahead and perform that operation. So that's all I've done. I've taken row one, multiplied it every, every entry by minus one. And I'm not doing anything else uh, to the other lines, so I simply copy those ones down. I have, I'm not changing row two, three, or four. Okay, so there I'm, I'm there. I am trying to get uh, uh, what I did before. I, I want to get, uh, I want to find out uh, well, which are the leading ones, and then I'll, I may be able to see that there's a free variable, and I want to have the leading ones um, such that they move to the right as I move down the rows. So I've got one leading one uh, uh, here now, and then I'm going to want to get um, the, uh, I'm going to be, wanting to get that thing there uh, to be a zero. Okay, so what will I do uh, in, in order to, to do that? Um, I will take uh, row two and I will subtract from it row one. So I will indicate what I am doing by saying what I'm doing. Uh, row two is going to change. It's going to change and I'm gonna change it in this manner. Row two becomes row two minus row one. In fact, I don't want to write it like that because I've been doing it like that. Row 2 minus row 1. The rows 1, 3, and 4 are not going to change during this operation. And I'm going to get another augmented matrix here. It's going to look like this. One, so row 1 is unchanged, so I copy it. Row 2, I, row two I'm going to take row 2 and my, to subtract row 1 and put that as the no, new row 2. Okay, so I get 1 minus 1 is 0, minus 1 minus 0 is minus 1, 0 minus 0 is 0, 0 minus minus 1 is 1, and minus 500 minus minus 100 is minus 400. Okay, then the other two rows are unchanged. Okay, uh, I uh, have the one leading one uh, still here, and now I have that all of these guys below it are zero. And then now I want to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now focus here. I want this to be a leading one. So I'm gonna just multiply uh, row two by minus one. Okay, so I'll write down what I'm doing. I am taking row two, 
and I am replacing it with minus 1 times row 2. Uh, row 1 is unchanged during this, and row 2 is every entry is the negative of what it previously was. It is easy to make a mistake doing this. You have to be very careful uh, with your arithmetic. It's easy to lose a negative sign or you know, just do the operations on half the row. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that easy actually to do it with, without error. We're gonna have a bit of a discussion about that after the fact. It's ways of noticing when you've made an error so it doesn't proliferate through your entire answer. Okay, so I've got a leading one here and I've got a leading one here that I'm gonna focus on making this thing here. Uh, a zero. How do I do that? I take row four and I subtract row two. So I will go ahead with that. I maybe I'll do that one in black. I I want to uh, I want to get this guy here to be a zero. And so I'm going to take I'm going to take row four and I'm going to replace row four with row four uh, minus row two. Okay. And then what do I get? Well, uh, row four is the only one changing, so I, I quickly copy these ones out, trying desperately not to make a transcription error. Um, and uh, and row four is the one that is changing, and that is going to be row four minus row two. So that's this one minus one is zero, minus one minus zero, zero minus minus one, and uh, 100 minus 400. Okay. All right, so now I've got, uh, I've got my two, got this one, this one, and then this is going to be my next um, uh, leading zero there, that means I want to make this thing here, sorry, leading one, I want to make this thing that I've boxed in there, the red box, I want to make that a zero. And how do I do that? I'm going to have to replace that row four with, uh, let's see, I have to add row three. So I have to go here, row four plus row three. And that gets me a another version, another matrix who's when you think of the matrix, this augmented matrix, as representing a solution, uh, sorry, that the that when you think any of these matrices can be th thought of as representing a system of linear equations, and if you wrote out the system of linear equations for each one of these matrices I've I've written down, all of those systems of linear equations have the same solution set. If it didn't, there'd be not a whole lot of point in doing this. Okay, all right. So one, zero. So now I'm caught. Row four is the only one changing here. So I'm, I'm copying. Uh, one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, one, minus one. And let's just get minus 100, 400, 300. Uh, so we're changing row four. And I'm adding uh, rows uh, three and four together. And I get this. There we go. Okay, uh, I stop right here. I'm going to stop. I've got <clears throat> three leading, uh, three leading ones here. So I got th I've got three variables, and then I've got this situation here of row of all zeros. I can see that there is no uh, leading one in a in the fourth column anywhere. So that tells me that the uh, x4 is a free variable. So I, I will make note of that. So now I can write out what the solution to my system of equations uh, is. So let me just uh, say that x4 is free. I'm going to call it some parameter t. And then I'm looking, that that's, that's what I'm getting from here. And then I'm looking here and I see, okay, that's fine. Now I see that x3 is equal to 300 plus x4 and x4 is t. Okay. And then I look up at x2. And x2 is equal to uh, 400 plus t. And uh, x1 is equal to minus 100 plus t. So I have, a, uh, I have more than one solution in this case. And I have uh, 
so I can choose T to be whatever I like, compute these uh, flows, and then if they turn out to be negative, I would re re reverse the arrow, and then I'm going to check my answer. So I could choose now well, whatever value of T uh, I would like, but I am going to um, uh, uh, pick something uh, that is sort of easy to c compute. So I'm going to choose X4 uh, is equal to T, and I'm going to just now make this choice. Let's, let's choose T to be 50. That will mean that, well, that means, of course, that x4 is 50. And then I can calculate the other ones. That will mean that x3 is 350, because it's 300 plus t. And then I calculate x2, that is uh, 450. And then I calculate x1 as uh, minus 50. And then I'm going to redraw the picture, and I'm going to see whether this worked. So I'm gonna, here's, the, here's the original. Um, picture that we had. We had coming in here, oh, sorry, coming out here 100 and coming uh, in here we had uh, 500 and coming out here we had 100 and coming out here we had 300 and then we had these unknown flows here where we had uh, some direction associated with x1. We had drawn the arrow this way, but we see x1 is minus 50. So we just reverse the arrow, and we note that the flow here is 50. The other ones turned out to be the uh, direction that we had thought. So this here is 50, uh, this here is 350, and then this here is 450. Those are our answers. We, this is replacing that x1, x2, x3, and x4. Um, with uh, the flows that we found with changing the direction on x1 because it became it was negative. Okay, now it's easy to check your answer. You should always check your answer. So you look here, you're like, okay, there's 500 coming in and there's 500 going out. Two thumbs up, right? Uh, you check another one. This must work, otherwise something has gone wrong. There is, let's just check uh, this one here. There's 50 coming in, 50 coming in, and 100 going out. Okay, so you do that at each node, quick check that uh, uh, things are working. So uh, check your answer. So there you have it, a network flow problem, and we use the techniques from the last lecture in order to solve the system. Okay, let's take another uh, example, how to uh, balance a uh, chemical equation. And... Uh, yeah. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to set this up um, to, with the variables, the things that we n need to know in order to balance this thing. And then we're going to use the information, the physical information sitting here with this chemical equation in order to set up the equations. And then we're going to, once we get the augmented matrix, we're back to grinding the machinery on uh, doing the uh, row reduction and seeing what the answer is. Okay, so what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to assign the I've assign, assign variables uh, to balance the equation. Okay. All right. So that means basically putting there's going to be some number of this molecule. I'm going to call it X1 times um, sodium hydroxide, and then I'm going to have here X2 times uh, sulfuric acid, and then I'm going to have X3 times this Na2SO4, uh, and then I'm going to have X4 times this. So some number of, of this guy plus some number of this guy is going to equal some number of this guy and some number of the water. Okay, so the idea is just to identify what is it that we need to know, how much of each one of these things uh, will be such that this thing will balance. We're going to make a note though when we do this that um, uh, x1, in this physical situation, x1, x2, x3, and x4 uh, should be positive. We're not going to have a negative numbers of some uh, um, molecules, so this should be uh, positive. Uh, that's uh, one consideration. Also, um, they should be integers. It it doesn't make sense to have, uh, you know, one half of a hydrogen atom. That does that doesn't make sense. So um, <clears throat> we we're going to note that because of the type of problem we're solving, we have additional 
constraints on our variables that we're going to have to make sure at the end that we've taken care of. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we've assigned the variables to balance the equation. The next step is going to be equate the number of atoms on each side. Equate the number of atoms of each type. on the two sides. Okay, so I'll just start with hydrogen. It doesn't matter which order you do them in. So I'm looking at the hydrogen, and I see that uh, uh, on, on the left-hand side, there's, because this is, there's a hydrogen there, and it's just, there's one of them. So I see one times x1, uh, and then I see plus, and you see here there's two hydrogens, so x2 is going to be 2x2, this is hydrogens, and then on the, on the right hand side I've got 2x4. Okay, so that's, that's what I know about the hydrogens. And I just go through this for each one of the, of the uh, molecules. So for the sodium I see that uh, x1 has to be equal to 2x3, and for the sulfur I see that uh, x2 has to be equal to x3. Okay, just, just stopping there just to indicate again what I'm doing. I'm seeing here there's one sulfur and here there's one sulfur. This sulfur is multiplied by x2, this sulfur multiplied by x3. That gives me this right here. And then oxygen. So that was going to be x1 plus 4x2 equals 4x3 plus x4. Okay, so we've developed uh, using each one of the elements, the hydrogen, sodium, sulfur, and oxygen, we've developed a uh, linear uh, equation in four unknowns, as we've got four equations and four unknowns. So now what we're going to do is rewrite those uh, in the form uh, with all the variables on the left and the all of the numbers on the right. So the, the just this is just a uh, algebra situation. X1 uh, plus 2x2 minus 2x4 is 0. Uh, X1 minus 2x3 is 0. Uh, X2 minus x3 is 0. X1 plus 4x2 minus 4x3 minus x4, also 0. Okay, so now what we can do is <clears throat> put those in, in those that system of linear equations into the augmented matrix, capturing the coefficients and the terms on the right-hand side in the augmented matrix. Looks like this. There's four equations. All of them have 0 on the right-hand side. Uh, there we have it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we've got an augmented matrix. And uh, well, I just want to point something out here. It's not really actually going to matter in terms of how we're, what we're going to do right now, but it's something that is going to come up uh, repeatedly. And you'll notice that all of these here are zero, which of course results in this entire column here um, being zeros. When that happens, uh, we, we, we call this a homogeneous a homogeneous system. And we're going to see that uh, uh, sometimes what we're going to do is look at the homogeneous uh, system and then look at the uh, non-homogeneous system after that. And, and the non-homogeneous system will be when some of these numbers, at least one of these numbers, is not zero. Okay, so that's just a, sort of a heads up on some new uh, vocabulary. So when they're all zeros there on, on the right-hand side, we call that a homogeneous system. Okay, uh, so now we're going to, uh, uh, I'm going to circle that first uh, leading one right here. And then, of course, my objective is going to be to make this a zero and make this a zero in my, in my Gaussian elimination. I'm going to do two row operations uh, at once. So I'm going to do, I'm going to replace row two with uh, uh, row two minus row one. And I'm going to replace row four with row four minus row one. And that's going to get me 
this new augmented matrix, which of course has the same solution as the original one. Um, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and 0, 2, minus 4, and 1. All right, so I've got now still my leading one here, and then I'm going to, I want to make this position right here also be a leading one. I could uh, here so swap rows 2 and 3, uh, or I could multiply row 2 by uh, minus a half. So I'm going to choose uh, to multiply row 2 by minus a half. So my next row operation is going to be replace row 2 by minus one half row two. It doesn't matter which one you do, but what you do want to do is, is you want now a one. You want to try, if possible, to get a one here in this next uh, uh, potential position for the leading one. Okay, so we're going to do it this way, and I'm going to do that, uh, do that row operation, and I'm going to get the following matrix here. I'm going to get, uh, so the only thing that's changing is row two. So I'm copying row one here, and row two changes like this, multiplying through by minus a half. And then row three and four are unchanged. Okay, so now I've got a leading one here, a leading one here, and that of course means I'm going to want to have these two things here. Um, those two positions there be zeros. I'm going to do that with two uh, elementary row operations and those two elementary row operations I'm going to do together and they are going to be this. I'm going to take row three and I'm going to replace that with row three minus row two. That's chosen because when I take this one and I subtract this one I get zero. Similarly I'm going to take row four and I'm going to replace that with row four minus two times row two because when I take this two and I, multiply, I subtract two times this one, I get the zero there. So I do those two uh, operations and I get the following uh, matrix here, one, two, zero, minus two, zero, and uh, zero, one, one, minus one, zero, and zero, zero, minus two, one, zero, and zero, zero, minus six, three, zero. All right, I immediately can see at this point, in fact, that row four is a multiple of, of um, <clears throat> row three. So I'm looking at this, I see uh, row four is a multiple of row three. So right away, I know I can make row four all zeros because I can, I mean, I just take row four and I, I multiply, to subtract three times row three and all the entries in row four will go to zero. And then here, I want to, I'm, I'm looking at this guy and wanting that to be a 1, so I'm going to take R3 and replace it at the same time here with one, minus 1 half R3. And then I will, with those two things combined, uh, I'm going to get the following uh, matrix here. And then it will be sufficient for me to be able to write out the answer. 1, 2, 0, minus 2, 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, minus 1, 0. Uh, 0, 0, 1, minus a half, 0, and all zeros in the bottom row. Okay, I'm going to stop because I'm right now in um, row echelon form. It's not fully reduced, but I'm going to just use back substitution in order to uh, get to the uh, final answer. So I'm now here, I, I given this thing here, I see that x4 is uh, a free variable. There is no 1 in uh, a leading one in column four, and I see that uh, the leading variables are x1, x2, and x3, because this is column one, column two, column three. In column four, I do not have a leading one, so I know that x4 is a free variable, and I will then <clears throat> write that x4 will be free, some parameter t. Then from this row here, I see that uh, x3 is one half x4 and that is one half t and then I'm going to get I'm going to look at the next row that one there x2 I'm going to see that x2 is what is x2 minus x3 
plus x4, and that is going to be minus 1 half t plus t, and that's going to be 1 half t. So I get that x2 is 1 half t. Then I take a look at x1. x1 is minus 2x2 plus 2x4, and that gives me uh, 2 minus 2 times 1 half t plus 2t, and when I compute that, I get t. So I'm going to write those, those things together. I, I'm going to see that uh, the column vector x1, x2, x3, x4 is looking like this, t times some parameter times this proportion, a half, a half, and one. Okay, that's x1 equals t, x2 equals 1 half t, x3 equals 1 half t, and x4 equals t. So you recall when we had the discussion about this problem, I need to now choose t to give me an integer. And given what I'm doing, I'm going to pick t to give me the smallest integer solution. So I'm going to choose t equals 2 to give smallest positive integer solutions. Okay, that will give me that uh, uh, x1. This is it, this because I've got a parameter. I mean, this this system has an infinite number of solutions, and I'm going to choose the value t equals two to get one one of those infinite number of solutions, and it's going to be this one. Okay, that's with t equals to two. I then now use these values, x1 is 2, x2 is 1, x3 is 1, x4 is 2, and that gives me the uh, balanced equation that I was looking for from the outset. So x2 is 1, so I see that 2 NaOH plus 1 times H2SO4 is balances with uh, uh, 1 times Na2SO4 plus 2 times H2O. And then what you can do is make sure that you have the same number of hydrogens on both sides, same number of oxygens on both sides, like that, and make sure that your solution is uh, correct. Okay, so that's our second solution, uh, our second application, uh, balancing a chemical equation. And uh, we'll move on to our, our third uh, um, problem here, polynomial interpolation. So actually this this actually turns out to be quite a, a, a big uh, topic. This is an important topic uh, to be able to take uh, uh, data and approximate it by a polynomial. You can take uh, other functions and approximate them by polynomials as well. So and then we, then when we, if we understand well how polynomials operate, we can often use that uh, uh, to see how uh, numeric data is working and and or other type of function data too. So this is actually a, a big, just a sort of a tip of the iceberg of actually quite a uh, big uh, topic, polynomial interpolation. Okay, so what, what are we what are we going to be doing here? We're saying that uh, given any endpoints in R2 that have different x coordinates, there is a unique polynomial of degree at most n minus 1 whose graph passes through all of these points. Okay, so let's just like look at a couple of examples so we, we understand what that, that theorem is telling us. And that is saying, basically, here's R2. R2 is a plane. Uh, and we've got two points in R2. Let us just say this, two points. Yeah, so what, what, and we're going to put uh, something through this, a polynomial. So we see here we can put a line through these two points. That's a polynomial of degree one. So we've got two points, two points. And then we put a polynomial through it, there it is, uh, it's a line, that's the equation of a line, and we see that the degree of the polynomial, we don't usually write it here, but there's a 1 here, so the degree of the polynomial is 1, so that's what it's saying, two points, then I can put a polynomial of degree 1 um, through it. Similarly, if I take a, a uh, uh, three points, let me just pick some three points like this, like that, the theorem is telling me, okay, I've got three points. The theorem is telling me that I can, I will be able to find a unique, I don't know what it is, well, that's actually going to have to go through the points. Let me try that again. Um, 
I can find a unique uh, polynomial. Let me just sort of if I can see if I can get the, how it's going to look. Just a sec. I'm probably maybe bottom out around here. So it's going to look like that. So I'm going to get a unique uh, quadratic, which of which equation will be like this: a naught plus a one x plus a two x squared. So that'll be a the unique second degree polynomial that goes through the three points. So I've got a I've got uh, three points, and then I have a, a quadratic quadratic fit. We would say we would fit a, we would fit a quadratic to those three points. And you notice the quadratic is of degree two. So three points, then the polynomial is of degree two. If I had four points, the polynomial will be of degree three. Okay, so uh, here, in fact, is what we're looking at. We've got four points. So I know from that theorem that there must be a, a polynomial of degree three that goes through these four points. So I know that I'm looking for a polynomial that looks like this. Okay, a cubic. So what do we want to know though? In order to know which cubic this function, which cubic function this is, we have to know what a1, a0, a2, and a3 are. So we want to figure out, we need, this is our job, we need to figure out a1, a0, a1, a2, and a3, because then we'll have a specific cubic polynomial and we'll know that it, it fits those three points. So how do we figure out what a0, a1, a2, and a3 are? Okay, there's four things we need to figure out, four things, and you notice we've got four points. So we use each point to set up a linear equation. We set up four linear equations and then we solve those linear equations to find a0, a1, a2, and a3. So we know uh, here, so this, this, this equation here has to be true for each one of these points. That's what it means for these points to be on that curve. So I simply, I simply write that out. I, I'm like, let, let us look at point one, this one first point. Let me look at that one. And what y is minus 2 when x is minus 4. So I write that here. Minus 2, that's the y value, is equal to a naught minus 4 times a1 plus 16 times a2 minus 64 times a3. Okay, so what is this? Uh, this is a naught right here. This is a naught. And then this is a naught times x. And sorry, a1 times x, and then this is a2 times x squared, and then this is a3 times x cubed. So I have one equation with a0, a1, a2, and a3 in, and I do this for all four of my points. So for the second point, that's this is going to be the second point right here, the second one, uh, so this will be here, the second one right here, I do the same thing. When y is 1, x is minus 2. So I put a1x and x is minus 2. So this will be minus 2 a1 and then minus 2 squared is 4 and then minus 2 cubed is minus 8. Okay, then the third point. This is the third point. So the third point here. I go ahead and do that. Uh, y is minus 3 when x is 2. So I simply substitute in those ones here. And then I do the fourth point. Okay, That's, this is the fourth point here. So I'll do the fourth point down here. That's going to be 3 is equal to a0 plus 4a1 plus 16a2 plus 64a3. And then look where I'm at. I've got a system of linear equations, four equations, four unknowns, and it looks like, um, well, it doesn't look like, it's definitely the case uh, that I can put this into an augmented uh, matrix. Now, I'm thinking of the variables as a0, a1, a2, and a3. So my augmented matrix looks like this. 1 minus 4, 16 minus 64, 
and then the number, uh, this number here, this number here. Okay, so I, I simply set up the augmented matrix just like we've done in all the other cases. So you'll notice that uh, here we have the coefficient on A0. Here we have the coefficient on A1, which is simply x, minus 4, minus 2, 2, and 4. And then we have the coefficient on A2, which is x squared. That is 16, 4, 4, and 16. And then we have the coefficient on a Q, uh, um, on A3, and that is minus 64, minus 8. 8 and 64. So that's the x value cubed. And then we have the, the y values uh, here. Okay, there we have it. We have a augmented matrix, and now we can perform Gaussian elimination, and we can uh, find out what the values of A0, A1, A2, and A3 are. And I'm going to leave that as an exercise. So that's an exercise, and it's, it's a bit of a painful exercise, actually, a 4 by 4 when they don't all turn out to be integers either. So it's an exercise for you. Uh, see if you can do that. But also, I'm going to say here, uh, it's an exercise. And then once you know how to do this, I mean, how many times do you need to do this before you're like, okay, I know how to do this. It's just a bit painful because I have to go through doing a lot of arithmetic, making sure I don't make a mistake. So once you're sure you can do the Gaussian elimination and that you can do it confidently, you know why you're doing the steps and you understand the whole process. After that, you do not need to keep doing it over and over again uh, and try this one out. Like do this as an exercise. So make sure you can do it by hand. And then and then learn how, for example, to enter into um, Symbol Lab. Right? You could enter this uh, uh, um, into Symbol Lab. You'll you'll enter this you'll enter this matrix times x equals this vector. That's how you'll enter it into here. I'm, I'm gonna put the numbers here for us to see. Like that, you enter this into Symbol Lab, spend whatever the 10 minutes it takes figuring out how to do that. It'll, it's, it's helpful even when you do do it by hand so that you can check your answers. Okay, so you enter that into Symbol Lab and it will solve for x. And that is, that is the value of a0. And so with this x here, I'm going to in fact write it like this. So this x, uh, the way I'm thinking of it, is uh, like this, a0, a1, a2, and a3. Okay, it'll tell you what it is, or you do it by hand. Either way, you'll find out that uh, you get this this answer. Minus three halves, uh, minus thirty-seven over twenty-four. It's a unique solution. Uh, Thirteen over ninety-six. Okay, you get that solution, and then what is that telling you? That is telling you that the cubic polynomial that goes through those four points given, that cubic polynomial is this unique polynomial. Okay, so uh, you can now test this out. I mean, uh, you like for example we know the point minus four minus two is supposed to be on this cubic so what you do is you put um x equals to minus four into here here and here and you make sure that uh, y comes out to minus two so this and that has to happen for all uh four of the points i mean that was the ob objective of what we were trying to do so now we have found this uh cubic uh um polynomial that uh, uh, that uh, goes through the, the the four given points and we we, we we without proof stated a theorem saying that that so long as the x coordinates are different on all um, of the endpoints that were given we will always be able to find a unique n minus one degree polynomial this is a very important uh, important uh, practical as well as theoretical result actually Okay, um, there's other applications uh, for this sort of stuff. Uh, 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 the global positioning GPS system um, is uh, using using this kind of a, this kind of method uh, in their applications. Uh, electrical circuits. There's a bunch of uh, um, uh, ways that uh, systems of linear equations can be used in 
understanding how electrical circuits are working. So that I mean, I'm just that's all I'm going to say about this. There's there's a bit more detail in our textbook, but uh, the idea here is that you've seen worked out in detail three uh, applications, and that there are uh, many more. So that uh, we see how we can uh, use what we've learned already in in a very practical way. Okay, that's going to be it for section uh, 2.3. I'm going to go back now in the next lecture back to uh, the first chapter of the book. Uh, it's a little bit more abstract. We've, we've, we came at it uh, starting with something that uh, you knew about uh, linear equations and systems of linear equations and we've developed a little bit of a slight abstract, maybe a slightly more abstract way of looking at them and now we're going to look at uh, what these uh, matrices and vectors are, 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 how we can think about them. And that's chapter one. We're coming to that uh, next. Thank you very much. Bye.